Evening, everyone. I want to thank you all for letting me come back and speak to you all once again. Will you all turn with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, our, our lesson tonight will be coming from verses, from verse 15, from verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. The scripture reads, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Now just from that scripture, I see three things. Now the first of those being, it, it tells us that there are false prophets. That false prophets exist. And they have been around for so long. Will you all turn with me to Deuteronomy Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. I'm going to begin in verse, in verse 17. Verse 17. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him, and it shall be that whoever will, hear, whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet commanded him to, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. God gave the, Jew, the Israelites, the Hebrews, I'm sorry, a warning in the Old Testament, just as he has given us a warning, just as Christ has given us a warning in the New with Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter seven. There are false prophets out there, and they will be trying to sway the words of God. They will be false teachers, false prophets, and as I like to call them, false heralds. A herald is someone who is from, from a kingdom and he enters into a city to pronounce that his king is coming. And yes, in the Old Testament, they had prophets to announce that their king was coming. And he came. And now we know here, we here know that he is going to be coming again. So every time that we speak a word from the scripture, every time that we teach somebody Christ. We are a herald to him. Will you all turn with me to 2 Peter? 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. What I'm about to read to you, I wish for you all to keep in your hearts and to remember this and to correct yourself if you ever start to feel these this way. I'm, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false, pro false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, brought, who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many, many will follow their destructive ways because whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. Do not sway from the path. If you start to feel yourself swaying away from the path because of somebody else's words that are going, that are directly 
going against God's, remember that they are exploiting you with deceptive words. They are deceiving you. Now, another thing that this passage really shows to me and really it just pokes out at me a little bit is how it says that they will be coming to us. So, so what can we do when they do? Well, first off, we must be prepared. Will you all turn with me to 1 Peter? 1 Peter, chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, I'll read verses 13 through 17. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it, if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than, to do, than doing evil. They will come to us. They will. It says it right there in the text. They will come to us. They may be hiding their true selves, but they will be slowly planting things into your mind. So we must be ready to give that defense, not only on our God's accord, but on ours. Turn with me, please, to Acts. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Some context for this. Paul here had gone and preached up in Thess gone and preached in Thessalonica. And he taught them the truth. And they denied it. And they threw him out of their city walls. I'll read verses, verses uh, 10 through 13. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 13. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women, as well as, as, well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul of Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Paul here tried to give the church at Thessalonica and the people in the city of Thessalonica the truth. And they didn't like it. And so they threw him out. So he said, so he dusted off his feet and he kept moving. So he went to Berea and he preached and people accepted the word. And then they hear this once more and they go to Berea. Those who were in the city of Thessalonica travel all the way to a different city just to go to him and to try to disprove him and try to teach their false doctrines at that time, which it was, since they were under the law of Moses. They weren't under the law of Moses, I'm sorry. They were practicing the law of Moses. and try to re-indoctrinate them back into it.
And lastly, the thing that most sticks out to me in this passage is how it plainly states that they're hypocrites. Every single one of them. It says right there, they will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. In 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, I've, I've had my own fair share of cuts and burns. They're not fun. They are not fun. I have many scars from them. Now their souls were seared with this hot iron. Not a fleshly pain, as we may feel here on this earth, but something deep within. Their souls are seared with that hot iron because they know they're being hypocrites. They know what's right, but they choose to deny it and teach it to others. Back in the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, I'll just read verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious. Those who have seen the word have seen God's grace. And we are told that once we see it, we are to put away all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, and all evil speaking. Now, these, these false prophets, these false teachers, they know what they're doing. And it is upsetting. It truly is to us who know the truth, who know that we're not supposed to be hypocrites, not know that we are supposed to follow the word of God. But as, but as it says, as we continue in Matthew chapter 7, I'll just, I'll just begin from verse 15 again. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Now I want to make this very clear. That does not say might. That does not say maybe. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. They will come to us, and yes, at, they may be sheep. They may look as if they are sheeps. They may look 
as if they want to be your friend and they want, they want to learn and know God more. But if they are not planted in the proper way, and if their fruits are showing otherwise, their works are showing otherwise, Well, we heard what the scriptures said. Now tonight, maybe, maybe you yourself have been dealing with a little bit of hypocrisy, either from others or in yourself, in your own soul. If you need the prayers to help with that, maybe, as I said, it may be a friend who is being a hypocrite, who is being double-sided on their words. Maybe you need your prayers to help them, for prayers for them. Or maybe you feel you yourself are being the same. If so, won't you come forward as we stand and as we sing? Once again, to our guests, we welcome you for being with us here tonight. We are always pleased and encouraged by your presence amongst us, so thank you for being here. And uh, if you have not yet done so, or if you have done so in the, in the past, we ask if you will to uh, share your contact information with us so that we can be able to study together. And if you have any questions about what we've been studying or about the gospel, please don't go home with those questions. It would be our honor to share the word of God with you and to answer those questions that you have with the Bible in hand. So it would seem or it would appear that young Tyler uh, copied some of our notes that we've been seeing on Wednesday evening. But for the record, he was not aware that we've been studying or we've been looking at the subject of how to deal with false teachers. But it is always refreshing to see that we can reach the same types of conclusions through the study of our God's word, proving then once more that the wisdom is of God and not of man. But as we've been able to see, we see as he used in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, uh, that indeed, false prophets and false teachers are one and the same. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, which our brother already read, we see that at that time, <clears throat> the way that the false prophets were identified was by what they spoke and what happened afterwards. Okay? In other words, if an example of this, if you will, go with me to the book of Jeremiah. There's a tremendous example there where what God is saying makes itself manifest there in the book of Jeremiah. And we see there in chapter 29. And beginning there at verse 31, or 30. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Send to all those in captivity, saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Jeremiah the Nehilamite, because Shemaiah has prophesied to you, and I have not sent him. And he has called you to trust in the lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah and the, the Nehilamite and his family. He shall not have anyone to dwell among this people, nor shall he see the good that I will do for my people, says the Lord, because he has taught rebellion against the Lord. You recall in the chapter, this man by the name of Shema, uh, Shemaiah, the Nehilamite, was saying that they were not going to be 70 years in the captivity. He was already in, in Babylonian captivity. Uh, he was already one of the, the uh, hostages, if you will, of uh, Babylon, of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he was saying that their captivity would last anywhere from two to five years, if I'm not mistaken. Well, God tells Jeremiah to respond to that and to tell the people that this man was lying. Now, how long was Israel in captivity? Seventy years. Therefore, Shemaiah, by the same definition of Deuteronomy 18, would be classified as what? A false prophet. Because what he said did not happen. You see that? 
he used God's name in vain. He spoke in God's name. In other words, he was speaking without authorization. And he was falsely using God's power or God's authorization to try to boost the morale of the Israelites and to try to make them believe in a false hope. This is why it is important for us to study how to deal with false prophets. You see that? Notice what Shemaiah was making the people believe in. What God defines as believing in a lie. He was giving them false hope. He was speaking without authorization. And he was using unlawfully God's name. Now, if we were to put this in terms of the law and say that your identity was used, your name was used to forge a document. And they spoke and they authorized without your permission. And they were using your name to give false hope to an organization. Would you be happy about that? What would you do? Very likely you would report that person to the authorities, wouldn't you? Because they're committing what? Fraud, theft, identity theft. What was, what was Shemaiah doing? He was committing a mid identity theft. He was using God's name vainly, unlawfully, and he was speaking as if he was a prophet of the Lord. And in reality, he was nothing more than a prophet of himself. We then have to ask ourselves, how do we begin to identify these beings? Now, our brother used the passage that we left off on last week, didn't we? He brought up the passage from Matthew 7, 15 and forward. The Bible teaches us that they will be, sheep, will be wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, we ask the question, what happens if a sheep begins to howl? And what should that tell us? He's a wolf. Sheep don't howl, right? Sheep do not howl, despite what Alex tried to convince us of last week. Sheep bleat. They don't howl, right? So if a sheep begins to howl, well, then we know that this is not a sheep, and we found a wolf amongst us. But will a wolf howl when it's in between the flock? Well, no. They're going to hide. They're going to creep in. They're going to crawl in. And which of the flock will the wolf target first? The weaker one, the smaller one. When we begin to see all of this, brethren, that then teaches us the very first thing, our very first defense against these wolves in sheep's clothing. Go with me to John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us how to begin to deal with these false teachers. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens. Now notice, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. What's the first defense that Jesus gives us against thieves or wolves? Unlawful entry. The way they get to a certain point, right? The way they get to the people. Does anyone remember what the scriptures say about Absalom when he almost took the kingdom from David? Go ahead, Rose. Go ahead. He 
Okay. He stood by the gate. And what was the entrance leading to? The throne of the king, wasn't it? And why would people come to the David to David's throne? They were coming for judgment. So where did Absalom enter through? He wasn't on the throne, but he was rather at the gate. And he was usurping his father's authority by doing what? Judging among the people. It was convenient. It was faster. The people got what they wanted, right? Go ahead. So the way he entered in through was not the legal way, was it? It was not the door. He was not the king. And he was not doing fair judgment. And Brother Kevin was mentioning that the Bible says that he stole the hearts of Israel. This is how he did it. He charmed his way into their hearts, right? He did it by giving them what they wanted to hear. What does the Apostle Paul say about false teachers in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Someone can read it for us. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 4. So what, what will they not endure? Sound doctrine. But what will they want? What will they keep for themselves? They're going to keep for themselves teachers according to what? Their own lusts, their own desires. You see, Absalom entered not through the gate. And Absalom's intentions were to steal the hearts of Israel. He wanted the throne. He was angry at his father. He held a grudge against his father because he did not believe that his father had done righteously by his own sister. He was angry at his father because his father had exiled him. He felt that his father had been more severe with him than his brother who had raped his own half-sister. So his Thoughts then were, let me prove to Israel that I am a better king. Let me start a revolution. Let me begin a coup by presenting myself as more suitable, as a better, as a better candidate. The first thing we need to see, brethren, is how they get or how they enter into our hearts, if you will. How do they enter into our hearts? Do they do it the legitimate way? Thieves will find shortcuts. Thieves will find ways to try to convince us without actually putting in the time, the work, or the devotion. They will not follow God's plan because they don't want it. They don't want to wait on God's time. They really want to wait on their own. And then if you go back to John chapter 10, Notice that the other thing that we must see is that Jesus gives us the second defense, or the first defense, if you will, in verse 3. The sheep hear his voice. Now, why do the sheep follow him? They know his voice. How keep ourselves from getting stolen? We need to know God's voice. Today, what is God's voice? The word of God, the scripture. So what should we know? The scripture. Why are there so many denominations in the world? Why is there so much confusion in the world? What is that? Itching ears. Because once again, what does the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, say they're not going to endure? Sound doctrine. You know, brethren, sometimes when the class 
or the sermon or the invitation or the devotional hurt is because it's necessary. It's necessary. You know, surgery is not a pain-free process. Just because we are placed under anesthesia does not mean that our body does not feel the pain. It does not mean that our body is not still experiencing that high level of pain when they're having to literally cut our flesh open. And depending on the type of surgery, sometimes even bones have to be broken. Our body feels that pain. Our body feels that pain as evidenced by the high blood pressure that begins to build, right? And just because we are numb in the moment, it doesn't mean that we're not in pain. Our nerves have just been numbed, right? Through the anesthetics. But sometimes, brethren, we have to go through that pain in order for us to heal. For those of you who've had rehab, how enjoyable is it? When you've been had surgery on a hip or when you had a knee replacement, rehabilitation is very fun, isn't it? Physical therapy and occupational therapy, the brother says it with such joy, doesn't he? <laughs> no. It's painful, right? It's painful and it's grueling. But why do we do it? To heal, to get better to regain strength and to regain the mobility of our limbs, right? Sometimes, brethren, pain is necessary. When a brother teaches or preaches God's truth in its entirety, sometimes some bones are going to be broken. Sometimes some, bio some boils are going to be If we understand that it is Jesus who is speaking, if we understand that it is God's word who is being spoken through, right? Then we will recognize his voice. And we will follow him. Not the preacher, not the teacher, not the orator or the presenter. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Sir? It penetrates. it penetrates, right? Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to start at verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Notice verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. Now, who is this him referring to? Jesus. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Does Jesus still speak today? Well, if you go to chapter 1 of this same letter, verse 2, what does the Bible tell us there? That in these last days, how does God speak to us? By his Son. How does his Son speak today? In the Bible, right? So those who are servants of Christ are going to speak what? The Bible. They're going to teach the whole counsel of God. They're going to speak as God has left it to be spoken. You know, a term that uh, the young man just used was herald, right? And as we know, a herald was simply, simply is someone who announces. Someone who gave an announcement on behalf of a lord or a king, on behalf of someone in a position of authority. But you know what that herald did not have? The herald did not have permission to add or take away from the announcement. The herald could not adjust or make an adjustment to make the announcement sound better or to make the announcement less grievous. The herald had to give the announcement that was assigned to him exactly as it was spoken to him. 
The only responsibility the herald had to do was to learn the message and give the message exactly as it was given to him. Because if he didn't, his life literally depended on it. What did God say in regards to Shemaiah? What was going to be the punishment for Shemaiah? He will not see. He will not see the good that I will do to my people. What is God saying there? You're going to die in captivity. You won't go back home. Because you're the one who's perverting my news, and because you're the one who's changing my message, you will not go back home. You're going to die in prison in Babylon. What was the punishment in Deuteronomy 18 of a false prophet? He shall die. So when we read this, brethren, if you go down there in chapter 12, verse 29, notice the warning, for our God is a consuming fire. These words are spoken in regards to the warning in verse 25. See that you do not refuse him. Sometimes, brethren, God's words hurt. And as Brother Joe said, they penetrate, right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 is what our brother has in mind. The word of God, which is referring to Jesus Christ, right? Many times the teachings of our Lord penetrate. Now, take this into perspective in the first century. The apostles were preaching to the Jews of the first century after Christ had resurrected on the third day, that Judaism was no longer effective. Now pay attention to that to a Jew who grew up his entire life and had several generations of Jews in his lifetime. Is that something they were going to want to hear? No. In fact, how did Saul of Tarsus react when he heard Stephen speak about this? What was the reaction that they, the Jews had in Acts chapter 13 when they saw that the Gentiles came to hear Paul speak? How did they react? They were afraid, but they were also envious of Scripture. Right? They were jealous because they had more Jews, or more Gentiles, excuse me, come to hear them. So what was the reaction that the Jews had? What did they immediately start doing? They start trying to kill and persecute Paul, but before they do that, the Bible says they contradicted everything he said. They refused him who spoke in the name of the Lord. They began to refute what Paul was teaching. They began to speak out against what Paul was teaching. Last, time, last Wednesday, we spoke about 2 Corinthians 11. What were those false teachers in Corinth doing in regards to Paul's authority? What were they doing with it? They were attacking his apostleship, remember? They were attacking his credibility. They were trying to assassinate his character. Always notice that these men who do these things, they are assassins. This is why God is righteously dealing to them, just as they are dealing to the people that they fool. You see that? Many times, brethren, we make the mistake of thinking, oh man, why, why is it such a heavy penalty? Why was God so severe? But once we start delving into what these people do and how they were truly so terrifyingly destructive, we see that God is actually dealing righteously with them. The people that were led into idolatry, the people that were led away from God's truth, notice that the Apostle Paul says that those who teach false doctrine, they seek to shipwreck our faith, right? Well, what they're trying to do, Jesus in John chapter 10 is teaching us and using the example is, they're trying to devour us. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
Some animal with sharp fangs bites me. It is going to be pleasant. And depending on where that animal bites, it can be deadly. Again. So if these people are trying to kill our faith, why then do we not understand that God is dealing out his righteous punishment equal to the crime that is being committed? Yes, sir. You mentioned the danger of the God making mistakes, trying to do these things a different way. Can having come out of God and make the right thing, actually turning to the Lord and making the right thing, change his mode in the previous step? The sad thing is it's a slow death, isn't it? It's a slow death. Think about a person who is sick, and they have a doctor who never tells them that they are sick, and they keep letting them believe that they're healthy. You're healthy, but I still want to see you next month so that we can keep you that way. But the only reason the doctor is doing it is because, well, he's milking the interest. What would the law do with that doctor if he is caught doing it? It would take away his license, but that's not all the law will do. He'll get in prison, won't he? That's manslaughter. So just... Yeah. To, to build off of what our brothers just said, right? If it hurts, it's because they're doing something wrong. But if you're living life as God wants you to live it, and if you're doing and following what God's word commands you to do, is it going to hurt? There's no guilty conscience to be pressed, is there? So if it hurts... It's not just the word of God trying to heal you. It's the fact that you are sick because you are sinning. And that sin is reacting to the cure. You see that? Can you imagine someone who, as they're pressing and you're in pain, keeps telling you, no, but this is normal. This is normal. You're not sick. This is normal. It's supposed to hurt that way. It's, it's a good kind of pain. You know, like when you've gone to exercise. Would you keep trusting that doctor? Thousands of people do. You know, Joel Osteen, I'm going to mention him by name because he is a false teacher. On national TV, he said that he does not preach about sin because he doesn't find it necessary. So on national TV, he admitted, I'm just a motivational speaker. How can you not preach about something that the Bible clearly shows and shines its light. Yet, this man has thousands and ten thousands of people who pay the entrance fee by the way. 
to go hear his motivational speaking because he does not speak about it. They don't want to get cured. They have no interest in hearing the truth. And therefore, we see that false teachers do exist. But how do we deal with the Joel Osteen's of the world? How do we deal with these men who are teaching false doctrine, who are making people believe that their souls are healthy? We first have to learn to recognize the voice of the master. We first need to learn to hear for and be able to identify the voice of the great and the good shepherd. No. Don't you have in your hand? Okay, all right. So when we begin, brethren, notice that the first defense that we have against false teachers is knowing the truth. Knowing the truth. If we prepare ourselves with the truth of God, with the whole counsel of God, if we learn to identify fact from fiction, then we won't easily be swayed into a shipwreck. But in order for us to know the truth, it requires for us to study the truth, doesn't it? Our time is up, but next week is the end of the month, so we will be having our uh, uh, end of the month devotional. But in two weeks, if our God allows it to be, this is where we will pick up. So, if you will, please bow with me as we close out uh, with the Bible, uh, with the prayer. Our precious Father and our heavenly God, Father, we thank you and we love you, Father, for being our God. Thank you, Father, for once more through thy scriptures teaching us and showing us, Lord, not only thy, thy true righteous judgment, but also, Father, how thy love for us is there. Because you have given us, Father, this word that comes from thy spirit, so that we, Father, can prepare, Father, and protect our minds, Lord, from false teachings that are, that are poisonous and seek to kill our faith. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to learn the voice of thy Son, who is the Good Shepherd. Father, as we continue to study this, Lord, allow us to understand how having our minds, Father, prepared and fully saturated with thy precious word can be, Father, beneficial in protecting us from false doctrine and in keeping us anchored in thee so that we will not go adrift, Father. Thank you, Lord, for always being there with us, no matter, Father, even if we fail thee. And Lord, when we have failed thee, we ask for thy forgiveness. We ask, Father, for the opportunity to be able to correct those wrongs, and that, Father, we may continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of thy Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen.